I would like to take the next 28 minutes or so to share with you a message entitled Why Was Jesus So Upset? And this is the second part of the message. We shall have a word of prayer, after which we will go right into the message. Would you be so kind to join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask that you will speak to us this morning through your spirit. Um, thank you, Lord, that you let us know the truth, and that truth always sets us free. Help me, Lord, that I'll be here not to impress knowledge, but to impart spirit. Hide me behind the cross so that I'm able to deliver your word to your children in your authority, in Jesus' name. Amen. The message is part two. Actually, for those of you who missed the first part, I would very, very much encourage you to try to go to the homepage and look at the first message so that you kind of follow the sequence. This is going to be a series of messages. I hope and pray we'll be able to uh, finish it at a certain point. Uh, but just follow along the series as I have these thoughts and these um, impressions that I really feel is necessary to pass on to the body of Christ. I don't think this is a message only for this particular congregation. I do believe that this is a message for the body of Christ. I do believe that it is something that is timely, and I do believe that it's something that is urgent. I have a sense of urgency in my spirit. Now, it's also very important to clarify the title because sometimes when you look at a title about Jesus being upset, you might just thinking that, oh, this is going to be an angry message. So now we all should all, you know, take off our happy hats and put on our angry hat, so let's all get angry. It's not about that at all. It's about the fact that there is a passage in the Scripture where in the book of Matthew chapter 23, I've encouraged you to read it at home. I wonder how many of you have read Matthew chapter 23 as the assignment from two weeks ago. Can I see your hands? Okay, we at least have about five of you. By the end of this series, I'm very sure everybody's hands will be up. <laughs> because I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna even, even touch on Matthew yet. We're gonna come to it. But I just want to give you the idea or the feeling that what happened in Matthew 23 is very, very significant. If you take the Jewish, uh, uh, context and culture into consideration. You will understand that in the context of the message, the kind of things that Jesus said to the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, even the priests were there, it was incredibly shocking because the culture demands that you pay respect to your elders, to your parents, especially to your religious leaders. But the language that was used, the, the mode, the tone, the, 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 the publicity in which it was, it wasn't done privately, but it was done openly and publicly, demands our notice. It makes us sit back and wonder, why did he do that? The, the, the people in those days, they would not even say anything rude to these people, but the, the, the language that Jesus used showed an immense amount of anger, upsetness. Why? why? Why was a perfect God? Jesus was the Son of God and He was also the Son of Man. Why was He so upset? What made Him so angry? We've got to understand that because if we don't, we have all almost missed the whole gist of Christianity, which is not meant to be a religion. From the beginning, it is meant to be a relationship. That's why today I want to bring you back a little bit to the beginning just to get a big view once again as to what was going on. What was God's plan? What was He intending for you and me to know? Just a little bit on the same introduction as we did the last time. To clarify that, uh, clarification of this uh, title is very important. Be, be clear that it is okay to be angry or to be upset or to be mad, or to be annoyed. The Bible says, be angry and sin more. Is that what it says? Be angry and sin little. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. It's okay to be angry. Anger is an emotion. And I've tried to explain to you that, in fact, in, in Christianity today, I think maybe one of the problems we are facing is 
Christians are a little bit off balance. We think that the Bible, because the Bible says that the kingdom of God is about righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. So we focus a lot on that and we forget about the fact that sometimes when things are wrong, we, we forget to get angry. We even correct people when they get angry. We tell them, don't get angry. Are you with me? Now, it's okay to be angry. But in your anger, don't sin. The focus is on sin, not on anger. Are you with me? So therefore, um, I think that it's important for us to understand when we see passages in the scriptures where Jesus overturns the table or he gets upset or he looks at his disciples and he says, have you no faith? It's not because he is, you know, tr going into sin. He's God. He, he doesn't sin. But he's trying to express an emotion that is a lacking element sometimes in the church of Christ today. There are many things uh, that upsets us. I spoke to you about this last time, and some of you were very honest. Some of you were trying to hold back, and that's okay, the things that upsets you. And we also talked about the fact that one of the biggest concerns that we have is injustice from little kids. Last week, we spoke about it. Remember, I told you how when you were a child in kindergarten, if you can remember this, I'm pretty sure most of us as children have done it before. One of the biggest issues that bothers us is when something happens and when we are corrected and we are wrong, we admit. But even as a child, when something happens, you're corrected and you're not wrong, your, own, your, your instinct comes forth and we always use the word, it's not fair. Have any one of you said that before? I think every one of us. Not fair. That's because injustice is built into our system. We as humans were created with a sense of justice. When, when Christ came to the world, his purpose was to bring about justice. So one of the major concerns in Matthew chapter 23, if you read Matthew chapter 23, you'll start to realize that there was such injustice that God incarnate, Christ himself came and he said, this is not what it's supposed to be. And therefore, we have to look into it closely to figure out why was he so upset. Jesus was upset because of the unfair treatment of the religious leaders. They were the ones who were supposed to connect the nation of Israel to God as an example for the rest of the world to understand what it means to be the salt and the light of the world. Instead, they have made Judaism just another religion, exclusive to themselves instead of being inclusive to the world. And Jesus said, that is not what God wanted to do. That was not his original plan. That is completely off the plan. Now, a closer look at the book of Genesis. I hope you can read this. Are you able to? Okay, let's see if you can follow as much as possible. Let's see if we can read it together. Maybe we just stand for the reading. Is that okay with you? Yep. If you can't see the front, maybe you can try and look at the back, but maybe you can just read along with me. Let's start reading verse, from verse 1. A closer look at what happened. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. Let's start by reading together from verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? You may be seated. As we go back to the book of Genesis, try to, 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 to picture this. 
the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And right after that in verse 2 it says, but the earth was, was void, it was empty, darkness covered the earth. The, a lot of uh, theologians have, have a theory, a theory of what we call a, a, a pre-Adamic theory as to what happened to the earth. You see, God's nature is such that His light, His life, everything He does is beautiful. And, and the Bible starts by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then He goes on to say, it was dark. Something just didn't sound right. God, light, life. You know, creativity, creation, sound, music. He created heaven and the earth, dark. Something just didn't sound right. Why was it dark if that's what it is? And, and, and God starts by saying, let there be light. And then there was light. And he saw darkness and he was like, it was good. And he keeps going on verse after verse where God cre creates, it was good. He's, he says it was good. When he says it's good, what is he comparing it with? He says something that is bad. Are you with me? It's, so you got to grasp this, that from the very beginning, as God creates the heavens and the earth, it seems like something has happened. Even before you and I were placed on this planet, even before Adam and Eve was there, something has happened in the midst of it. And this is, why when God created man and, and he said it was good, Adam was created and he decided to name all the, the living beings and God placed him in the Garden of Eden and says, tend my garden. And the only thing that was missing was a, a mate, a helpmate. So he looked at all the animals and there was nobody that could be a help to him. And finally God puts him to a deep sleep and takes one of his ribs out and makes woman and she comes into the garden God himself presents her and Adam says, now this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. I will call her woman. And so it was. And so now there was man and there was woman and there was God. And according to the scriptures we can read, there was this fellowship. There was this relationship. And, and they, they, they had this glory of God around them. You know, the the, the, the thing about being in the presence of God is that when you come into the presence of God and you leave, James was talking about uh, you're shining today. You know, that, that, that shine is just oil but, uh, or cream. But you know, when, when, you, when you enter into the presence of God, when you come from the presence of God, there seems to be always this glow, this light, the glory of God shines around you. When Moses spent so much of time in the presence of God and when he came out, the, the Bible says that his face was just glowing and, and he had to put on a veil to cover because people kept staring at him. Are you following me? In the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter was up, Peter and, and John and James, and they were upstairs in the mountain with Jesus, and suddenly Elijah and, 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 uh, and Moses had appeared, and Jesus was there, and he says the glory of God shined around them. Can you remember that? So that, that glory is that brightness, and this was the brightness. Adam and Eve apparently were naked, but the glory of God was around them. So they were just shining and, and they realized that there was life and there was fellowship. They walked together, they talked together with God and there was, a, oh, nobody knows how long before Eve came about, but there was this connection, there was this relationship, there was this discussion. And God entrusted them responsibility. And God, as he entrusted them, he said, I tell you what, all of this is yours, but these two is mine, don't touch it. There was a principle, they understood biblical principles. They understood the, the, the divine order, not the human order. Are you with me still? While all of this was going on, the Bible tells us that the devil enters into the scenario and he begins to give them an alternative. And the alternative was, this is what God said to you. I'll tell you, you can have this, but not dependent on him. You can do it yourself. That's what religion is. Religion is DIY. You know, back home where I come from in Singapore those days, when you go to a furniture store and you see a chair, you pay for a chair. And then they said they would deliver it at such and such a time, and you receive a chair. A chair, just as you see it, or a cupboard. But when I came to Europe, I realized that when you go to a store and you want to buy a cupboard, you ask for a cupboard, and they give you a box. Then you go home and you open up this box and you're supposed to fix it yourself. It's called DIY. 
do it yourself. God gave Adam and Eve a relationship that was just fresh from heaven. And the devil says, I give you a box. You do it yourself. You don't need God. Are you with me today? That's the alternative. That's the alternative. And it's amazing because the, 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 the Bible tells us that you know, the devil was there, he saw what was going on, and, and I think women have taken quite a, a fair amount of beating because we always hear about this, this scenario when we talk about, we see the, the conversation going on between the serpent and the woman, and quite often we say that, ah, everything was beautiful, and then God made woman. And although most of the men will be very excited and happy about it. But the fact is, man was there before women. And he had a relationship with God even before she was created. And when she was put there, while this conversation was going on, do you know what Adam was doing? What was he doing? What was he doing? He says here, she also gave some to her husband who was with her. In other words, he just stood there the primary creation and the secondary creation, because he was made out of him, the primary creation just stood there and watched what was going on and observed, enjoyed, and said, oh, let me try as well. Are you with me? So to get in fact, I think what Adam did was far more abhorring compared to what Eve did. He didn't intervene. He didn't stop. He didn't say, hey, you're not supposed to do that. He's supposed to be responsible. There was no sense of guilt. There was no sense of conviction. There was no sense of conscience. It was just, let's jump in the party. So in other words, both of them had speculations and thoughts. But this sin did not come as part of God's creation in heaven and in, in earth. It came even before because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Something has happened in the heavenlies. Something happened in the heavenlies before it transpired down here on earth. And it's just so sad that Eve and Adam gave in to it. And the very first reactions and response, when they had a relationship, they had the glory of God, they had fellowship, they were walking together with God, talking, they were tending the, in, in the garden of God. And the moment sin entered the world, we start seeing incredible symptoms. This is what religion does. Religion appeal, it, it's very appealing. It's good for the eyes. It's, it's, it's good for the flesh. It gives you wisdom. You know what is good. You know what is evil. Some people say, but, but there's nothing wrong. What is wrong with knowing good and evil? You see, the problem is that there's a massive difference between our human understanding of what good and evil is as opposed to God's standards of good and evil. Are you following me? So God says, I will teach you, Adam, what is good and evil. What is good, what is evil? My standard, my justice. But the devil's supplement is, it's a humanistic understanding of what is good and what is evil. Everything is permissible, but not everything is edifying in the scriptures. Are you, are you following me? You can do all things, but not everything is going to build you up. And so, when this alternative was presented to Adam and Eve, they took it and they fell. And it was said. And the response, this is what religion does. At first, it makes you feel like it's okay, it's good. Most religions in the world, don't get me wrong, no, no religion starts off by saying, okay, in our religion, we just go out and we kill and we murder and we steal and we rob. Most religion teaches generally, humanistically speaking, good things. Are you with me? Most religions. Humanistically good things. But there's a massive difference between divine order and humanistic principles. Massive difference. Massive difference. The moment they started to fall into it, their eyes were open, they suddenly realized they were naked, the glory disappeared. When God said, you're gonna die, he wasn't talking about a physical death, he was talking about that relationship that you had with me is gonna be severed. And when that is severed, that's what we call a spiritual death. And when that spiritual death happened, their eyes were open and they were like, what happened? And their eyes were open. And they realized they were naked, so they sewed 
fig leaves together. It's, it's, it, fig leaves is a symbol in the scripture of what we call um, uh, Israel. Israel is a, is a, is a, is, is, is a nation was, which was supposed to be coming into the, the world, and uh, fig leaves is a symbol. And so they sewed fig leaves together, and then the wife and the man, they heard the sound of God, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from him among the trees. For the first time, we, we, we see fear. Fear is in the picture. Before, when there was a relationship, there was this faith, there was this joy, there was this connection. And now they heard God and they quickly ran and they were hiding. They, were, they didn't want to see him anymore. There was fear introduced into it. And it was not meant to be in our human relationship with God. And so we went on and, and God called them. I, 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 I had to end in this scripture because still today, God is still reaching out and he's still calling, where are you? Where are you? And when God is calling us, I love the songs we sang this morning, seriously. We talked about him being our friend. We talk about knowing you. It's beautiful. This is relationship. God is saying, where are you? I don't want another religion. I want to have a relationship with you. That's why I sent Jesus, my son. Are you following me? Now, let's go back a little further. Pre-Adamic period. What happened? What happened? The Bible tells us about the devil's plans to replace God from day one. If you look at the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, the Bible is referring to, uh, to the king of Tyre, and, 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 and uh, as we go on further, it makes a specific uh, description to the devil himself. He says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning? How are you cut down to the ground? You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. The original sin that came about was when the devil himself decided, I'm going to be like God. I don't need to be told what to do. I will be in command. I will be in control. Are you following me? That is the essence of religion. That's where it came from. And that was what Adam and Eve fell into. Instead of having this wonderful relationship with God, they gave in to this, I want to take control. I want to take control. Let me just conclude with a couple of thoughts, and then if there's time, I'll just share some other thoughts with you. It's interesting because in the book of Luke chapter 8, 10 verse 18, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. There was a war that took place in heaven. During this time, the devil himself wanted to put himself up and become like God. There was a war, even before the earth was created. There was one third of God's angels who were worshipping him. They were somehow convinced by the devil himself, and the devil had one third of the angels who came together, and two thirds of God's angels, and there was a war, a war in the heavens. Now, um, if we have wars on earth, one of the worst weapons you could think could be used is maybe nuclear weapons. But when you're talking about angels going to war, these are explosions beyond our imaginations. So big was the explosion between these two forces that God had to destroy them and create a place, create a place called hell for the devil and his angels during this war. And so in such an explosion, you know, today, till today, we have a lot of theories as to how was the world created, what, why is it so dark outside, maybe there was a big bang, there was some kind of an explosion. One interesting concept could be there was a huge clash between two heavenly forces before God recreates, but there's something about the earth that God decides, I want to do something here. God, the Bible says he has this love for, for the earth, for God so loved the world and mankind. And so, after that war, we have the recreation, and, don't, and then Jesus said, because he's with God, he said, before Abraham, I am, he said, I saw the devil fall like lightning. So the devil himself 
had been judged way before that. And the beautiful thing is that sometimes you think, oh my God, if the devil is sent to the earth, what's going to happen to us? Jesus also said in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, I love this scripture. Maybe we should read it together. Are you ready? Let's read it together. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Hallelujah. For those of you who think that, okay, today I can be easily bought over and, and I'm so tempted to take a religious view of Christianity, Jesus has given you authority over the devil. Hallelujah. We, we used to have a song that we used to sing, My God's a Big God. I love that song because we don't serve a small, tiny, puny God. It's a big God, far bigger than the enemy. He can't just walk into your lives and, and, and mess around with you because God has given us power and authority. Religion is all about control. It's all about, I want to be in control. Like the devil says, I want to go up to be like the Most High. That's what religion is about. Whatever religion it is, Whereas a relationship that Jesus is offering, God's offer through Jesus Christ is a relationship of faith and humility. It is not about control. It's about, I humble myself. I serve you. I enjoy knowing you. I want to be with you. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me just close with this one thought before we uh, close in prayer. During the time of, of the tabernacle, when they worshiped the Lord in the tabernacle in the wilderness, they put up a tent, which is called the tabernacle of worship, and the people would come into the tabernacle to worship. And God gave Moses the recipe for a very special incense. This incense was in the temple, and it was always burning. Something very interesting, because the tabernacle also provided a shade, especially for the scorpions and the snakes. They were out in the wilderness, you've got to remember. These insects and these uh, serpents would just try to find a shade. But because that smoke and that incense was up all the time, it was also a form of a disinfectant. The smell was a disinfectant that whenever the incense was there, the snakes and the scorpions always disappeared. You know, this is a symbol that our worship, our worship of God, our worship of Jesus, our worship in church, our worship at home, in our own temple, drives out the forces of darkness, drives out the devil himself if he ever tries to come close to you. Are you with me? That's the relationship. God wants us to have a constant relationship with God so that we are able to overcome the temptation of replacing it with a religion, but rather to have a living relationship with God. I'll just close in a word of prayer for the sake of the recording, and then I'll share with some other closing thoughts with you. Father, we just ask that you would bless us, help us to come closer to you with a true living relationship. I ask that you will inspire us, Lord, inspire us by your spirit and help us to come closer to understand and know who Jesus is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a journey that we take together. It's soul food from the heart. In God, we're united in our differences. It's a place of getting in touch with God, others, and your destiny. Come and visit ICC, the International Christian Community, a church where great things come together.